turning back for a, a very short time to the chapter we had in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and taking really in verses 1 down to verse 10. I guess for the sake of a text, we can look at verses 4 and verse 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and so on, down to verse 10. The last time I was home, we found our first digital camera. This camera was probably eight or nine years old. And we took out the wee card, of course, and plugged it into the computer, and we loaded up the photos we had on this camera. As we saw the photos and went through the photos, we saw just how much, in a short space of time, how much our family had changed, how much our village had changed. People, of course, who were there now no longer with us. Houses being built, houses now gone. In a short time, so much change had taken place in our, our wee lives, in our small village. But of course, looking back over it, the change was indeed big. A lot had happened. Big changes had happened slowly. In this letter, Paul constantly reminds this church in Ephesus about the change that's taken place in their lives. Again and again, Paul brings their minds back to remember what they once were, to remember and to see what God has done for them to change their lives. Again and again, we see Paul gently leading them through these thoughts. Now, compared to many of Paul's letters, as we know, uh, Ephesians is quite a gentle letter in some ways. There's other letters where Paul is, uh, with respect, a lot more uh, blunt, a lot more to the point, a lot more harsh, some may say, in his language. In Ephesians, in general, we find quite a gentle letter uh, by Paul. That, of course, is not the case in our verses this evening. In Ephesians 2, in the first few verses of Ephesians 2, as we just read just now, Paul is anything but gentle. So, of course, Paul is writing to Ephesus. Ephesus was made up of the church in Ephesus, made up mostly uh, of Christians from a Gentile background, a non-Jewish background, in many cases a pagan background, uh, not familiar in many ways with the Old Testament or with Jewish practice. Uh, We know from Acts that Paul spent a good amount of time in Ephesus, he, he knew the church well. He had worked with him before. And here we join this letter in chapter 2, at the beginning of this section, where we see Paul speaking to this church. He's speaking to this gathering of saved sinners, and he is asking them to remember. He reminds them what they once were. He reminds them then what happened in their lives, what change took place, and then finally he reminds them of where they now are and also where their future lies. And for a very short time this evening, that's uh, the route we'll take also. As we read these verses, please think along and follow along Paul's narrative. For the Christians here this evening, listen as Paul leads you through these verses. And as we go through them, think for yourself where you once were. What were you once were? Where you once. And then think what took place in your life. What took place in your life to take you from that place to where you are now. And then lastly, take joy as, as Paul gives an insight into the future of the Christian. An encouragement as he describes our current position. For those here this evening who as of yet are not Christians, who as of yet don't know or worship Jesus as your Saviour or as your Lord. Listen to these verses. Like we said, he's quite harsh. It's not perhaps easy reading. But Paul uses these words out of love. And please listen to these verses. Listen to how Paul describes where you now are. 
But then also listen to how Paul describes your only escape route from that place where you now are. And listen to where Paul says you can be. If only you would trust and believe. Like we said in verses 1 down to verse 3, Paul gets straight to the point. He instantly reminds these people that they were once dead. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Paul allows no breathing space. He allows no room to come up with another answer. He says, before you knew Jesus, before you were saved, you were dead. There's no place here for sitting on the fence. Because, as he goes on to say, because we're born as sons and daughters of Adam, because we're born in that state, we are born dead. We are born hating God. We are born with sin, if we like, as our default position. We're born hating our Creator. We're born hating God. Now some, perhaps even some here this evening, may doubt the reality, may doubt the evidence for original sin. Of course, that's a sermon for another night, but we'll see in a second that Paul leaves no doubt for that. But supposing, supposing there is no evidence, it makes no difference really. Because the first sin you commit, you're still in the same position anyway. You're still in front of a God who is holy and perfect, with nothing to do, nothing to say. But of course Paul makes clear, he makes perfectly clear that we are born in sin. Look with me please to to verse 2. What does Paul say? Paul says, following the course of this world... Following the prince of power of the air, who is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Sin and disobedience, it's, it's part of who we are. It's in our genes. As fallen men and fallen women, we are by nature always going to go against our God. Again in verse 3, Paul makes a clear, even more clear for us, where he calls children of wrath. You were children by wrath, by nature children of wrath. <coughs> Just following the passions of the body and the mind, doing what you wanted. There's nothing else you could do, but you were trapped. You were born doing this and you carry on doing this. Very often we hear the illustration and a well-meaning illustration that before we're saved, we're like someone who's, who's drowning or someone stuck in a bog and God comes along and he, he throws us a lifeline and we, he pulls us out. Well, that is not the gospel image. It's not the image that Paul uses here. The truth is, we're not struggling for help. Before we're saved, we're dead. Completely helpless. No care for God. In fact, like we said, we're, we did anything and everything we could to rebel against God. As Paul says here, we followed the course of this world. We were taken in by all its promises. We were taken in by everything the world offered us. We were promised such great things. Money, and a, an easy life, a good life, a good job, perfect family. Of course not bad things in and of themselves but once these things are all we think about and all that we aim for then we're so blind to our real situation all the time the world offers us bigger and better and shinier and nicer things and we're all so taken in by this we're so taken in by it that we're blinded to our reality but if we're honest with ourselves and if this is you this evening I don't know many faces at all this evening. And even if I did, it makes no difference. Only you right now know where you stand before God. If right now this is you, you're trying to live a good life, you're trying your best, you're doing okay, 
You're trying your best to keep a family going, to keep yourself going, to keep a job going. Again, not bad things. But if that's your whole life, if that's your whole purpose, then you're missing out on something. And all the time, surely there's that thought in your mind, there must be more than this. I wake up every morning and get dressed and go to work, or I go and study and come home. Every day, same in, same out. What is the point of it all? What's the point? And the question is, why? Why, before we were saved, were we never really satisfied, never really content, never really happy? Well, first of all, it's because we had to do something to suppress the reality of the truth that we knew there was a God. We knew there was a God. That before we were saved, we knew fine well that God existed. We have that in Romans 1, verse 18. Where we see the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. To, to suppress the truth, to suppress the reality, we have to do something, anything, to keep our minds busy. The reality that there is a God we all must one day answer to. That reality is too big for us. We can't bear that reality. So we do anything and everything to keep ourselves and keep our minds busy. To distract ourselves in various ways. And the question, my, my honest question this evening is, friends, do you know this feeling? Right now, as, as you sit here, as you think about these verses, do you know this feeling? The sense that there must be more than this. The sense that you're your life, what's the point of it? Why am I here? I live, I work hard, I retire, I pass away. In 50 years, 100 years, our names are all forgotten. We are forgotten. I'll be forgotten. The world tells us we're living here on a planet hurtling through space. For no reason, no point, no purpose, all meaningless. Compare that to the gospel reality, the gospel truth that we are made with and for a purpose by a caring creator. We all perhaps know it so well. Our catechism, our first question and answer. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. We're made to worship God. We're made to find our, our joy and our purpose and our, our fulfillment in worshipping him. And until we do so, our lives will never be right. And we will continue on dead in our sins. See, people think they are free without God. They think they're free without having a God over them. The reality is we all have our masters here this evening. Every one of us, we all serve someone. The Christians here, we know we serve our God who has bought us with the precious blood of his son. If we're not here tonight as Christians, then the question is, who are we serving? Who are we following? What Paul tells us in Verse 2, we're following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And who is this prince? Who is this spirit? We know, of course, it is Satan. There's no pleasure, I assure you, there's no pleasure in reading these things, no pleasure in proclaiming these things. The reality is we have to say it because it's true. And there's no pleasure for you just now if you recognize yourself in this situation. If any of this is striking a chord with you, do not let this chance pass you by. Do not let this chance pass you by. Like we said, by nature we rebel against God. By nature we do everything we can to avoid and go against Him. And if any of this is striking a chord in your mind, then that is not coming from you. Certainly not coming from me. Is coming from God's word speaking to you. God 
speaking through his holy, perfect word, his living word, don't let this chance pass you by. With respect, we can all become so comfortable in our routine, so comfortable coming to this building, so comfortable perhaps in everything we do on a Sunday. We forget how real this is. This is not just something we're doing to tick off uh, a box for the week. This is real. This is serious. This is, really is life or death. Don't ignore. Don't forget it. Pray. Pray that God would open up his word more to you. Pray that God would help you to understand his gospel. Pray that he would save you. So here we have in verses 1 down to verse 3, the state that these Ephesians were once in. Paul reminds them who and what they once were, who they once served, what they were once like, what their lives were once like. And the question is, what took place in their lives to take them from that place to where they were now? What has taken place in the lives of all the Christians here this evening? Well, the answer, I would say, is one of the most beautiful phrases in Scripture. Uh, Look with me, please, to verse 4. Verse 4. But God... These two simple words, this one short phrase, contains such incredible power, such incredible beauty and truth. All that we've just seen, all that reality that we were so lost in our sins, dead in our sins, looking for meaning, living lives that led to nothing, confused and lost in darkness, so alone, so far from God, living looking for something, anything. All this going round and round and round and then in verse 4 it stops. It just stops and we have these two words. But God. Now by all means, what comes after these words could well read, but God, because he is holy, because he is just, because he is perfect, decided that Donald McLeod deserves to be removed of the face of the earth. But God, because he is perfect, decided that humankind had no more place in this plan. But God, because he is perfect, decided to cast all into a lost eternity. What does verse 4 actually say? But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and so on. Even whilst we were dead, we were there fighting against him, there hating him, there despising him, and there is exactly where God found us and intervened in our existence. Where God saved Christians here out from. Of course, when we come to look at the, the topic of the love of God, it's, it's a, an ocean we can just dip our toes in. And even at that, we are soon running out of words and descriptions to use to describe the, the great reality of it. But let's note one thing from verse 4 about the love of God. Look again, please, with me at verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us. Loved us. The sense of that term is something that goes back. Something that goes back and goes back and goes back. And the question we have to ask is, when did God first love any of his people? When did God first love you or me? Please, for a second, turn back to chapter 1, the previous page, Ephesians chapter 1. And look with me uh, at verse 3 onwards. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. 
as we seek to answer the question, when did God first love his people? Ephesians 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, and so on. When did God first love his people? Before you were born. Before your parents were born. Before this church was built. Before our, our planet existed. Before time and the universe and reality itself existed. Our God. Our glorious Godhead. Knew you, saw you, knew all about you, and right now, as you love him, as you worship him, as you serve him, it was part of God's plan to save you, to intervene in your life whilst you were still fighting against him, to intervene whilst you were still doing anything and everything to hate him and to show that hate to him. God had planned that the Father would send the Son. The Son would come, live that perfect life and die that necessary death and rise again. God a plan the spirit would come and he would he would open your eyes change your heart of stone to heart of flesh before you even knew who God was before you even were born God had set his love on you of course we're just skimming the surface here and if you want more on that study Ephesians 1 uh, study well, for the latter half of Roman study of this chapter again, uh, Paul of course makes much of this, but the reality is we come to speak about the love of God for his people, it's not just some new love with respect, he, he just decided to show us one day, the love of God for his people goes back and it goes back and it goes back before time and reality itself why does that matter? this is not just some dry theology for us to, to, to understand and to to, to nod along with. This is something that should mean something for us. That whilst we were still fighting him, that God, he knew when and exactly where in your life he would intervene and transform you. It also means that as we worship God and as we live lives as Christians, as we find ourselves failing time and time again, we can have the solid assurance, the solid assurance and hope that because God's gift of salvation to us had nothing to do with us in the first place, it's a gift we cannot lose. Not one Christian here this evening can lose his or her salvation. And to think that we can is to put our own sinful ideas onto scripture. God is clear. And he is clear in these verses. He's clear in Ephesians 1. That his people are special to him. Special in, in the greatest sense of a word. Where before we were born, he knew us. Before we were born, he chose us. Before we were born, he had factored and part of his plan was that he would in his own time save us. Of course John Owen not known for for his short sentences not knowing not known for for um, being brief in any way thankfully John Owen did have a few brief quotes and this brief very brief quote is pretty useful for us to think about and have in our minds. Uh, John Owen talking uh, about uh, our salvation he says quite simply 
All that we contribute to our salvation is the sin that makes it necessary. God gives us life. God makes us into new creatures. God saves us from eternal separation, eternal death. God saves us from hell. All for his own glory. All the work of his undeserved grace in our lives. By grace you have been saved and raised us up, seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That takes us to this last section. We've just seen what we once were. Paul reminds these Ephesians that once you were lost, once you were without God and far from God, once you were dead, then God in his perfect plan intervened in your life and he saved you. He transformed you. He gave you a new life. And then Paul closes this section by reminding them and telling them what they now are and indeed what their future holds. We have that roughly in verses 5 down to verse 10. Quite simply, as we said, the state of a Christian is simple. They were once dead, now alive, taken from death and brought to new life. Once enemies of God, hating him, fighting against him, and now by his power, Christians are servants of God, but also, as we see in scripture, even called friends of God. This, of course, is no small change. Of course, uh, as any Christian here this evening will tell you, the Christian is by no means made perfect in that second, at least in a in an earthly sense, uh, I was saved around 12 or 13, and I remember as a young Christian thinking, right, I am sorted now. I will never sin ever again. Um, I probably got about two or three hours, and I realized just how, how silly and how wrong and how much I misunderstood what it meant to be a Christian. Every Christian here this evening, we're all, I'm sure, firmly aware of how often and to our shame how quickly and how easily and even if we're honest how willingly we fall away from what we know to be right what we know to be true how willingly we we often sin how easily we often fall away from God but of course God's word tells us and we must believe it that the steady work of sanctification has taken place in our lives it's taking place right now the slow work where God, by the Spirit, makes us more and more like our Saviour. Where slowly but surely, the Spirit, he transforms us and changes us to be more and more like Jesus. Of course, like I said, very often for ourselves, the process we perhaps don't see, don't notice. Others often see it in us. But it's something that we must believe because scripture tells us it's true. It's a process, of course, that won't be complete until we enter into eternity. Paul, in verse 6, he, he perhaps uses quite a strange term here. It says that God has raised us up with him and has seated us, as Jesus, with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Perhaps a strange phrase to Paul to start using now. What image is he using here? Why is he saying this? What does it mean that these Ephesians at this time, they were seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus? It's beyond praise that God should save any of us at all when we see that there's more to it. God doesn't just save us and renew us and give us new life as if that's not a good enough thing he then gives his people more God shows more grace and more love to his people and how does he do that well he promises us this this place seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus of course every good thing we have comes in and through and from Jesus he is the one 
who is our goodness. He is the one who is our grace. Jesus himself is the one who is all that we have. But God promises us this seating in the heavenly places. This place in eternity. And what does this remind us of from the Gospels? We should bring our minds back to the words of Jesus to his disciples. As they were confused as to what was happening with him. What did Jesus promise his people? That I am going to prepare a place for you. If I go, I will return. So on. Our hope is not based on the here and now. God blesses his people right now. We're blessed with the knowledge of our salvation. We're blessed with the fellowship of his people. We're blessed of worshipping and praising him. But where does our ultimate hope lie? It rests and lies in the fact that we have the sure hope and knowledge that one day we will join completely and totally with our Saviour in eternity. These are not just nice words to help Christians get through life. This is not just something we, we say to each other to, to help us in bad times. This is God's truth. This is something we know to be factual, we know to be right, we know to be solid and sure. Then in verse 10, we also see that there's also a, a present aspect to the Christian's life. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, of course, it's not just the case that we become Christians and we just do our own thing then. Of course, we all know that not to be true. The reality is that our lives have purpose, that we are saved to serve, that God has set us aside to worship him, to love him, and to serve him on our time on earth. A reminder for us that not every one of us, of course, can serve in the same way. We can't all become uh, ministers. We can't all become presenters. But the gospel reality is we all have a place in God's uh, present kingdom. Our place in, in God's coming future kingdom we understand. But God's present kingdom we see from the end of the chapter we had in verse 19 onwards. We are fellow citizens. We're all together, working together with one aim. Each one of us, we have a place and a purpose in the church of God in general, but also in a, in a practical sense in the local church. God has placed you here for his glory to serve him. Not one person here cannot serve in some way. Whether that's a, a, an open practical service or perhaps a service of constant prayer for this congregation and for our island and for our nation equally useful equally essential to God's kingdom we're made and saved to serve we're his workmanship he's crafted us for good works that we should walk in them we were once dead once so far from God once hating the one who made us <coughs> Then God, in his grace and his glory, in his love for his people, intervened. God intervened and he transformed our lives. He transformed who we were. He gave us a, a new hope. He gave us a new purpose, a whole new reality. And a whole new future. And then we see that we have a promise of uh, eternity spent with him. And also the, the clear instruction of a lifetime of loving service. And that, of course, is for Christians here this evening. I am just passing through this pulpit. And my honest, genuine question is, how long have you sat in these pews? How long... Have you heard the simple gospel? It's the only gospel that we have to offer. 
It's the only gospel you're ever going to hear that is true. How long have you sat in these pews and still you have done nothing? You say nothing. How many excuses do you have left? How many more reasons do you have to not believe what you've heard again and again and again? The work has all been done. The work has opened. Where in verses 1 to verse 3 do we see Paul saying in any way whatsoever, because you Ephesians were so good in your faithfulness, because you Ephesians were so careful, because you Ephesians were, were such good people, no, what does he say? But God, there's nothing you can do to impress God, nothing you can do to, to win his love for you. Verse 4 so simple. The gospel is so simple. Believe. Trust in the only one who can save you. Okay, this is not just some vain thing we're saying. This is our heartfelt prayer for you this evening. I'm sure those here who are, who are Christians here this evening, that is their prayer for you too. We're so thankful you're here. We're so thankful you're hearing God's word. So thankful you're, you're gathering with us. Our prayer is you would come to know him. Stop fighting against him. It's a battle you will never win. As we said, right now, each person here this evening, we stand before God, either as those who we see in these, in these verses, as those he has cleansed and those he has, has made friends, or we stand before God this evening as his enemies. There's no sitting on the fence. There's no middle ground here in these verses in this chapter for us. There's no middle ground anywhere in scripture for us to find a hiding place in. We know him and we love him and we're his. Or we're still fighting against him. We're still rebelling against him. The gospel is clear. Call out for him. Call out and pray to him that he would save you. Before the end of this hour, this night, don't waste any more time. Cry out that he would save you. Cry out that he would reveal the truth of his word to you. Cry out that he would take away all this burden that you have, my friend, and that he would transform your life. For the Christians here this evening, Read this passage again. Study these verses in Ephesians 2 and rejoice. Rejoice in the power and wonder of what God has done in your life and in my life. Of how he has transformed you without anything from you. How he has transformed you and changed you. Given you a brand new life. A brand new eternity. A brand new hope. All for his glory. Let's bow our heads now. a word of prayer. Our Lord God, we, we come before you this evening and we humble ourselves before you. Lord, we thank you for the great gospel. We thank you for how simple you have made the gospel. How simple it is that all may hear it, that all can understand it. Lord, you forgive me for uh, anything I said that was incorrect, we thank you that the power is not in the, uh, the poor men who stand here, Lord. The power is in your inerrant, holy word. Your perfect word. Your living word. Help us, Lord, to cling on to it as we go through this life. We pray as we carry on to worship you again just now. We would do so with hearts and minds full of praise. We would worship you singing to you and knowing you as our God and as our Saviour knowing you as the one who is walking alongside us right now. It's God we sing your precious name's sake. Amen. Our Lord God, we thank you again for the chance we had this day to set aside a few hours to listen to your word. Help us as we carry on and begin this new week to truly do so in your strength, understanding that if we go alone, we will fail. Lord, we go along with you. If you go before us, if you go with us, if you protect us behind, 
Lord, we can be sure that no matter what we encounter, supposing even as the earth gives way beneath our feet, that we will remain planted on you, our solid rock. Help us this evening to take joy and take time for the rest of this night to think about you, to think about the great change and transformation you have taken place in our lives, that you have um, shown to all your people. Help us as we begin this new week uh, for many here. This would be the week where they cry out to you. They call out to you to save them. They cry out to you to transform them and to give them that new life they desperately, desperately seek after. Ask all these things in Christ's precious name.